Looking ahead to the future. After graduation, what next? Yes, dear graduate friends who will be passing out, it's that time of the year when results will be out and you will be asking yourselves, what next? I'm told some of you have no clear answer. Indeed, when I went to a job fair recently, I looked around at many who were expecting jobs, but they came with no credentials, with no certificates. They were not sure what they wanted to do. So I asked some of them, and here were their responses. Some said, if they didn't get a job, they would continue with further studies, perhaps the MA, MSc, MCOM. Some said they would do short-term job-oriented courses, for instance, the B.Ed. or the D.Ed. to get into teaching. Some felt they would enter into their family business, or still others felt they would start their own business, and we call those startups. Many said they would start job hunting in Goa or in the rest of India and even abroad. And for that, they said they would scan newspapers for jobs in the situation's vacant column or that they would advertise themselves in the situation's wanted columns. Some felt so sure that if they approached the MLA, they would get a job. Now, what are the ground realities? The truth is, if you talk in terms of economics, there is a tremendous demand for jobs and much, much less supply of jobs. Despite that, one needs to remember that there's no guarantee that your job application letter will get you a job because there's so much of bribery going on, so much of influence that counts, as I just said, of the MLA or certain prominent personalities. Then again, there's a lot of discrimination on the basis of religion, caste, class, and even language. Companies may invite you as walk-in interviews or to send in your application through a job application letter. So now what would a covering letter with the CV or resume B. Let's look at the CV. It stands for Curriculum Vitae or Vitae. And by definition, in Latin it means the course of one's life. It's a short account of one's career and qualifications, one's skills, abilities, and accomplishments prepared by a job seeker looking for a position or a job in a company, school, government, and so on. The curriculum YT, or the CV as we shall call it, is also called resume, taken from the French, meaning summary or to summarize. Together with this CV, one sends the cover or covering letter, which tells, in short, what the CV will contain. So that brings us to what are the functions of a CV. It's like a career marketing tool through which 
you hope to obtain an interview with a prospective employer. Many of us have gone to trade fairs or exhibitions. Let's say we went to a trade fair where there were scooters, bikes, cars. They would give out handouts and you looked at those and decided which bike or which car you wanted. Then again at exhibitions, test samples of chewed uh, sweetmeats and even tea and coffee and so on were offered to prospective customers. You had those and you decided what you wanted. The same with the CV. You show the CV and it gives, a, gives an indication, an idea of what you are capable of. Yes, it's a tool to demonstrate that you are employable by speaking about your qualifications, your experience, your skills and so on and so forth. A good CV reflects your strongest assets in an attractive and ordered format. Mind you, there are no hard and fast rules. What I am going to give you is a suggested format, but perhaps already in college or maybe through your friends, parents, teachers, you might have been given another format. Follow what suits you. So the format I am suggesting is where you firstly give your contact details with your name, email address, phone number. You may or may not give your residential address. Then you have the opening statement which should indicate who you are and the job or position you are applying for, briefly telling the contribution you can make to the company. For example, you may state, I am a fresh arts graduate seeking a job as a clerk in your company, having an energetic, cheerful outlook and a willingness to learn any assigned task. Then again, you would need to tell about your educational qualifications. Now you may or may not want to give all the details, for instance about the SSC or the higher secondary, but if you do, then follow a reverse order beginning with the graduation and then your SY, FY, higher secondary and the SSE. You may give details under headers such as name of the college or school, university or board, location, percentage, date of passing and so on. Then you may list out your key skills, especially technical or software skills, if that is what is required. If required that you be proficient in languages, mention those, especially if you have foreign language proficiency. Then you may have some specific short-term training Mention that. Work experience, if any, or participation in the NCC, NSS, Red Cross and so on. Or you may have done some voluntary work, maybe blood donation drives, collection drives for clothes, toys, food, etc. Part-time work placements as part of your regular college course. For example, psychology students doing case history work, all these could be mentioned in your CV. Next, you could highlight your personal attributes or assets, which may be relevant to the job. For example, your communication skills, 
interpersonal or team skills, planning or organizational skills. Note that you may use descriptive terms such as that you are a hard worker, honest, reliable, responsible, trustworthy, with a willingness to learn, or that you are a fast learner, energetic, cheerful, and cooperative. Next, you may have some personal accomplishments. For example, certificates and awards in classical or Western dancing, singing, musical instruments that you can play, or today in martial arts, karate, and so on. You may be eloquent in elocution, drama, sports, games, swimming, athletics, mention all these. You may talk about published articles and course related presentations. What about your participation in hobbies and your interests, both co-curricular and extracurricular? Talk about them. Next, you may or may not mention references or referees, by which I mean people who will vouch for you, like your principal or an eminent personality. This was required in the past, but it's not absolutely necessary today. Let's look at some extraneous points that you may want to bear in mind. I said that you could use some descriptive terms, but be honest in what you include. Then again, be brief. Practice precy writing. Don't go on and on repeating the same point over and over again. Have an organized, consistent format. Your CV should make a good impression. You may have to write several rough drafts before the final copy. And if necessary, get it reviewed by persons who can point out where you could improve. You could have headers in large font size as compared to the details. However, the font size at all times should be readable. The headers I just spoke of could be to the left with proper spacing between paragraphs. At all times, use simple direct language. There is a temptation to use high-flown language, but make it easy on the reader. For example, the recruitment manager, who may have to go through hundreds or perhaps thousands of application letters. Therefore, use key words pertaining to the job and its requirements. Now, why have I said this? In UP, there was a job for a pun, and mind you, there were over 600 applicants for just that one pun's job. And who do you think were in those applicants? There were graduates and postgraduates. And imagine the tension for the recruitment manager to go through all those applications and select whom to call. Next. If it's a computer-based job, focus on your computer skills. Be neat, legible, aesthetically pleasing, having a proper margin space all around. And for greater legibility, preferably send a typed copy, unless a handwritten one is asked for. Some ask for handwritten applications because they can read through your handwriting how neat, how tidy, how dedicated you are. At all times, use good,
quality paper which does not smudge or get easily crumpled. Next, much has been said about inaccuracies which spoil your CV. Therefore, be accurate in spelling, language and in punctuation. This adds to your CV being aesthetically pleasing and is a great plus point. Some more on your cover or covering letter. What is it? It is a letter that you send with your CV to give an explanation or brief information about your CV. By analogy, it is like a foreword to a book. Points that you should keep in mind are address it to the specific person as mentioned in the advertisement. For example, if it's asked to send it to the personnel manager or the recruitment manager, it's bad to say to whomsoever it may concern. No, address it to the personnel manager. Be brief and to the point. Make reference to the newspaper and the advertisement date on the basis of which you are responding. Or if it was not mentioned in any newspaper and you heard about this job, then you may say, I am given to understand that there exists a job in your company. Indicate the job applied for and stress on your valuable skills that you could bring to the job. But in brief, because most of it will be mentioned in your enclosed CV. So mention that you have enclosed your CV and end with a request for an interview. Next, according to the instructions given in the advertisement, you could send either a paper version of your CV by post or an electronic version via email or you may personally hand in a hard copy CD with details of your curriculum YT. Next, let's focus on getting ready for the interview. It's recommended that you have a mock interview with your parents and friends where they will point out how you come across by asking you questions and focusing on your answers. Now, if you get called after sending your CV or if it's a walk-in interview, then do the following, which will be a great help. Research the company you wish to join. That is, get to know about it through their website or through social media. And if you know where this company is located, you may stand outside and meet some of their workers and casually ask for information about the company. Very importantly, anticipate and prepare for questions you may be asked. For example, you may be asked, tell us about yourself or why are you interested in our company or in this job? Or again, why did you choose us amongst the many companies that are available? Be prepared for your answer. Sometimes you may be put off by negative questions such as, what is your biggest weakness? Then again, you may be asked illegal or inappropriate questions. For example, will you get married and then leave us? Or after marriage, will you ask for maternity leave for your pregnancy? 
be prepared for such answers as well. Very importantly, focus on your apparel or your attire or the outfit that you will be wearing for the interview or if called. These should be suitably impressive without being showy or overly stylish or loud and gaudy or revealing or even casual. For example, you should never go to an interview in jeans. Personal grooming is important and it would include your hair, your nails and control over your body odour. Therefore, have a nice fresh bath, have a facial if you have to or trim your hair, beard or shave it but don't have any fancy hairstyles or for women, even some men, unconventional nail polish, it can distract. Men, if you're wearing shoes and preferably wear shoes, get your shoes polished. Women, use simple makeup and minimum perfume. Take your bag or your purse or a briefcase and let it contain only relevant items. For example, your certificates, your mark sheets, medals, photographs if necessary, a pen and a pad. And above all, print out extra copies of your CV. Why? Because sometimes it may not be a one-to-one -one interview, but it may be a panel of interviewers and the copy that you sent is only one. So if you have extra copies, all those interviewing you may have a copy. Friends, punctuality is a plus point. So the night of the interview, the previous night rather, sleep well so that you get up fresh and energetic. Now what do you do at the interview? Firstly, enter or walk in with energy and enthusiasm. Don't ever commit the error of putting out your hand for a handshake unless the interviewers first do so. Then again, greet the interviewers warmly, but not in an exaggerated or gushing manner. I remember an interview again where the interviewee sat down without being told to sit. That's another crime. So at the interview, you stand till the interviewers tell you to sit. Then again, listen to what the interviewers say or ask without butting in with needless interruptions. Unless, of course, you have not heard what they said and you want some clarification. Show your best personality, that is, smile, be friendly and let your body language show the three C's. What are they? That you are cool, that you are calm and that you are confident. Some interviews involve group work or group discussion. In that case, aim to be a good team worker. Show your language skills your communication skills by speaking clearly, audibly, correctly with proper pauses and intonation. But at all times, avoid cockiness or putting on superior airs. Then again, avoid over-familiarity in your speech with the interviewers, even if you know them before the interview. 
you have to pretend that you don't know them. So don't show any familiarity. Will all interviews go well? No. So avoid showing disappointment, even if you think the interview has not gone well. Why? Because obviously everything is a learning experience and failures at this interview can become a stepping stone to further success in other interviews. Very importantly, be alert, observant and listen carefully to interviewers. While waiting your turn for the interview, don't gossip with other interviewees. An incident I read about spoke of a job for someone on the ship who needed to know the Morse code. There was a message being flashed on the screen in Morse code. And what did this message say? It said, if you read and understand this message, walk in to the interview without any hesitation. Amongst the interviewees, one of them was alert. He read this message and walked in and got the job. The others were busy chatting and so obviously they missed the message. Something else you could remember is that you should not ramble or talk too much because it will betray your nervousness and you may disclose things that may harm your job prospects. On the other hand, avoid yes and no type of answers while answering to the point. Now imagine the interview is over. In that interim period, what should you do? It's a very good policy to acknowledge with a thank you note or a thank you card. Thank you to the company, thank you to the interviewers. And while awaiting results, attend other interviews because you are never sure that you may get the job you went for. That you may be the best person for the interview. You may have all the qualifications, but there are times and situations which are beyond your control and only God is in control. So pray before your interview, during your interview, silently ask the Holy Spirit for guidance and after the interview, pray for your interviewers to be fair and just in their deliberations. Remember Psalm 127 verse 1 which says, even though the builder build the house, he should not forget that it's only God who builds his house and not he himself. So if you are seeking a job, it is God who will give you the job, not yourself. So pray at all times and trust God. I wish you all the best, dear graduates, and do well at your interviews. God bless you.